Uh, and I want to welcome you to the graduate student panel. Um, so I would just like to ask our panelists to uh, turn their camera on. Um, and then um, just want to give you a bit of an overview of the format of the panel, just so that we are all on the same page. Um, so we will begin uh, uh, by having, giving an opportunity to our panelists to introduce themselves. I'm going to uh, call on them uh, in no particular order, uh, other than the order that I see them uh, in my Zoom uh, gallery. Uh, and I am going to, um, uh, after they have a chance to introduce themselves, tell us about, uh, uh, you know, a little bit about their research, who they're working with, what lab they're working in. Um, and uh, th then we'll go through the questions that uh, the audience asked and posted on, on Slido. Uh, I will go through the, the questions. Uh, there's a lot of great questions uh, and I'll try to organize them a little bit um, so that we're not jumping around too much. Uh, but hopefully we'll get to discuss some of the topics that we did not uh, talk about during the faculty uh, panel. Uh, and this is also a great opportunity to hear from, from your peers, your, your uh, future colleagues. Um, so I'm hoping for a uh, fun uh, uh, panel. Uh, all right, so, uh, oh, and one more thing, we'll try to go until about 10 minutes uh, to three o'clock, at which point we'll try to split into breakout rooms and get each of our panelists into one of the, the breakout rooms so that uh, you can chat a little bit more and maybe answer some of the more specific uh, questions. If that sounds great to everyone, uh, then we can start with Andrew, who happens to be uh, the first uh, in my gallery. Uh, thanks, Nicola. All right, hi, everyone. My name is Andrew, Andrew McCrabb. I'm a fourth year PhD student here at Michigan. Um, I work with Dr. Valeria Bertaco on um, uh, hardware accelerators for graph analytics. Uh, I did my undergrad at Auburn University. I went straight from the undergrad to the PhD program. So for those of you who are in that position, I might be able to help out a little bit. Um, I've done a number of various service roles in the department, which uh, I, people can ask about if they'd like, but I'm glad to be here to uh, answer some of your questions and help you figure out the whole grad school thing. Thank you, Andrew. We have Xiaoying next. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xiaoying. I'm also a fourth year PhD student. Uh, my advisor is Matt K, who is not in the department anymore. <laughs> I can talk about that too if anyone's interested, like what happens if your advisor moves from, you know, one place to another. But um, my research is in human computer interactions, specifically uh, information visualization. I think about questions such as how we can help people make visualizations better and easier and more correctly. That kind of great questions. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here and this is I know third time I'm doing this so I'm excited to meet you all virtually yeah that's me thank you and now uh, we are just seeing a surge of questions about what happens with advisor leave uh, in uh, Slido uh, Kevin um, hello everyone uh, I, my name is Kevin Pranowski him his and I'm actually a master's student a first year master's student this is my first year here in Michigan uh, I'm also an international student from Peru, South America, and a Fulbright Scholar. So maybe if you have uh, any questions about uh, how international applicants can work their resume or compare to people applying from, the, from other parts of the world, I might be able to solve some. And I actually don't have an advisor, but I do hope to keep working in what I was doing research in undergrad, which is AI and robotics. So yeah, and nice to meet you all virtually. Thank you, Kevin. Nell. Hello, everyone. My name is Nell Escher. I'm a second year PhD student. Um, I did my undergrad at Northwestern in cognitive science. Um, then I went to law school. Um, and then I did my master's um, in computer science at Michigan. And from my master's, went into a PhD program. So happy to talk about any kind of non traditional routes into uh, grad school and uh, Wish you all the best during this uh, 
exciting, but sometimes stressful time. Thank you. And uh, Shengpu? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shengpu. Uh, I'm a first year PhD student working with Professor Jenna Wins, and my research lies in the intersection of uh, machine learning and healthcare. So I'm particularly interested in applying reinforcement learning techniques to learn uh, the optimal treatment strategies um, based on the data that are already collected in the hospitals. Um, so I did my undergrad uh, at UMich, and then I transitioned into a master program, and then now into a PhD program. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about more my experience or anything uh, about research or, yeah, really glad to be here. Thank you all. And it's great to hear that uh, we have PhD students, master students, master students who uh, uh, went on to uh, now pursue their PhD uh, degrees. That is great. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of uh, great questions, um, a lot of hard questions as well. But I want to I want to give you uh, an easy one, um, just so that you don't say uh, that, uh, you know, I, I don't do the same thing that I did uh, in the faculty panel. Um, and that one is, what do you plan on doing after graduation from uh, P your PhD program, your master's program, whatever um, program you're currently in? Um, uh, some of the examples in the questions were professor, industry job, postdoc, and uh, so on. Uh, and normally I would, I would call on uh, some of you uh, if the, the question is particularly relevant, but uh, I would like to open this one for anyone who wants to go first. Well, I can go ahead and start if uh, no one else wants to. Thank um, you, Andrew. So uh, quite frankly, so going into my fourth year, you'd think I would know by now, I don't. Um, I have recently done an internship with uh, um, a, a company in hardware, um, and I really enjoyed some elements of that. So there's a lot of things about industry that I that I find appealing, but I also really enjoy the elements of teaching that I've experienced so far. So I I don't know yet, even as a fourth year, and I hope you guys know that it's okay to not know even as you're going in. Um, but uh, yeah, still still trying to figure that out. Looks like I have a difficult job on calling on someone else. So Nell, how about you? Sure. I also don't have things all figured out yet, um, but I think academia would be very cool, a chance to do more research and especially teaching. Um, but I could also see a lot of different paths kind of laid out ahead. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things you can do with a, a graduate degree in computer science. Um, and so uh, one thing that I'm interested in is, is potentially going into the uh, political sphere and uh, helping people create policies around technology. Uh, Kevin, you are a master's student. What, what about you? Well, to be frank, I think there are a lot of possibilities, like people said. And I think it's okay if you don't know exactly what, what you want to do, but it also can help to know if there are specific things you want to do. Uh, in my case, for example, uh, there are three things that I would like to do. Uh, maybe personally a PhD in the future, not sure if we'll do it after I finish my master or if I will work at some point. Then I would like to turn back to my country and teach a few classes there because I, it's a way that I can give back to the country that uh, initiated my education. And then the other one is that I would like to do some work that also highlights uh, why we should consider diversity in our studies in artificial intelligence, basically. So I'm not sure when I will do those three things. And <laughs> then I could do one first, or maybe do the three at the same point. Who knows at, the, at this point? Uh, because of the state of the world, because you don't know what you will discover when you are studying or when you are working with such, so many people here. But these ideas are in the back of my mind, and I'm sure that I will tackle them at some point. All right. Well, we have. Two more panelists, who wants to go first? Uh, I can go. So I think um, I initially uh, entered into the master and PhD program uh, thinking that uh, I'd want to be a professor in the future because I really enjoyed teaching. I really enjoyed uh, sharing knowledge and exchange ideas with other people. Um, but uh, I guess I slightly changed my mind a bit. Um, I'm trying to look for an internship to get more of an experience, uh, industry experience 
um, to see how that goes as well. Um, yeah, um, but I'm also open to like a teaching focused faculty position if that's possible in the future. Yeah. That leaves you, Cheyenne. All right, um, so I still haven't made up my mind yet. Um, I, I just had this conversation with my advisor and um, but I think like doing an internship during the PhD like uh, in industry would kind of help you, um, I guess, refine on your decision. Uh, one thing that I learned from my last internship was that it's also possible to teach in internship. That that fact I didn't know before. I know that there are in industry labs in uh, industry labs that does research, but you can also like teach like classes in nearby universities or just like a volunteering activity that you can do. So, uh, I mean, I don't have my own answers yet, but I'm just sharing this piece of information if you're trying to make up your mind about like industry or academia. Well, I'm not answering the question really well, but. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a great answer because it, it probably points to, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to still be uh, thinking about it, figuring it out as you go, changing your mind. Yeah. Uh, and if that's the case with, with, you know, PhD student, master's students already in graduate school, well, probably it's fine also with applicants uh, as well. So that's, that's encouraging to, to hear. <laughs> um, but this, uh, this was kind of an, an easy question. I, I, wanna, I wanna get to some of those harder ones and probably uh, the questions that the, a lot of applicants have concerns about. Um, uh, so there was a question that says, how demanding is the PhD program? But I would really open this up more broadly. How demanding is, is graduate school? You know, uh, both of you, uh, you know, who are doing PhD, those of you who are doing masters right now, those who have, you know, done one and are doing the other right now. Um, and then maybe some of the follow-ups there as well. Um, you know, do you have time for your personal life? Uh, you know, are there any sacrifices that you have to make? How are you managing? Um, and uh, maybe we can start, uh, well, let's start with Andrew uh, because you, you've been in the PhD program for, for a little bit now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so with the fourth year, I've now got three years under my belt here. Yeah, so I have the exact same, that was probably the main question that I had when I was going into grad school was how much time am I going to have to myself here? Um, and I think one thing that I sort of knew logically, but I didn't really internalize was that everything is much more flexible whenever you get to graduate school as opposed to your undergrad or quite frankly, sometimes in, in some capacity, your master's. Um, you don't have to take quite as many classes at the same time. Uh, and there's not nearly as much of a structure there. So you can organize your time however you want. And depending on how you manage your time, that can either uh, increase your ability to have a personal life or decrease it. So if you manage your time well and you're able to adapt to the various responsibilities that you have, but the less time constricted elements of those responsibilities, uh, then you'll have plenty of time. So I, for myself, um, I travel about once a month uh, for like a four or five days or whatnot to go see my family or go see my girlfriend or whatnot. Um, I teach one or two, well, uh, until COVID, one, once or twice a week, I teach a dance class and I'm usually dancing like four or five hours out of every week. Um, so, and I still have time to play video games. I will watch movies with friends sometimes. No, I still get plenty of work done. Um, and there are some days where I, you know, especially before a deadline, uh, where I'm really churning things out and I'm not quite as available and I put in a lot of hours to get that paper out. Um, but if you put yourself in a good position, you manage your time well, it's absolutely possible to have a really strong personal life just out while you're in graduate school, in my experience. Kevin, do you, you want to contrast that maybe with uh, how it is for you as a master's student? Yeah, of course. Um, something that I would like to also add is that in my case, uh, I spent some time working in the university that I graduated from uh, first. Uh, before applying to at the master's degree. So at first I did have a bit of a shock of how much work I was supposed to do. And, and this was mostly because I had to spend like three years working. So I had forgotten, you know, the regular rhythm that you get into school that is doing your courses and making sure you're, you're accomplishing your deadlines and your goals. So at first it was a bit difficult. So, but then you get back into that rhythm and you start to realize, like Andrew said, that you 
that's your power here is that you are much more able to manage your time. So my advice from that would be that you need to prioritize the things that you want because there are a lot of things that we do in our personal lives and not all of them are urgent and not all that are that important. So you definitely can uh, give time to those, but you can also decide that is it necessary if I do this thing that I like every week or maybe every couple of weeks. And the other advice I could say is that listen to the people that are already in grad school because uh, at first, especially when you are just accepted and you have that energy of, yes, I'm into grad school, I can take on the world, you might be tempted to uh, you take a lot of courses or get into a lot of responsibilities that you know you won't be able to accomplish because they are quite time demanding or you are not as super powerful as you thought you might be. And that's okay because part of grad school is also to realize that there are so many things that you can do and you can do them if you organize yourself well. And also there are some things that you will have to say, okay, maybe I will not do this now, I will do it later. I will do it when I know more or when I have more time. Those are, those are very good answers. Um, so uh, any anyone has uh, other perspectives, other experiences? Uh, Shampoo, you, you said, I'm oh, sorry. Now you were going to go. Go ahead, go ahead, please. Sure. All right. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with everything that's been said. I think a lot of it is also very dependent on kind of your context and what you're coming into grad school um, needing to know and um, the responsibilities that you take on. So um, I actually had a, a harder time um, when I entered the master's program because I didn't have an undergraduate degree in computer science. And so I was doing a lot of work on the side to catch up um, while also uh, working as a GSI, um, if you haven't heard about it yet. Uh, being a graduate student instructor is a very cool thing that um, you can do at Michigan where you can teach and it pays your tuition and pays your money, uh, your, a stipend, um, and is a, a pretty nice option um, for, for getting through grad school. But it is, um, you know, about 20 hours a week, uh, 20 hours a week of work on top of your studies. Um, and so I, I felt, um, you know, when I was in that situation, uh, I had a harder time managing my, my personal life and my schedule. Um, and then now in the PhD program, I think a lot of times how much of a personal life you have is a little dependent on lab culture. Um, and I think that's kind of specific to the, the PhD program. It's, it's the, the expectations that your advisor puts on you as well as um, what your peers around you are doing, I think is, is a lot of times informing what kind of personal life you get to create and carve out for yourself. I'm in a supportive environment, <laughs> so it's nice. Go ahead. I see you. You unmuted yourself. Uh, you you have uh, you have experiences with uh, what three different uh, programs at, at Michigan? Is that true? Yeah, that's right. So I do want to say the transition for me is uh, kind of more gradual. So I because I started with the undergrad program at UMich, uh, so everything is very structured. Uh, I just have to pick the courses I take and. Um, satisfy all the requirements and the courses, you know, uh, all the assignments, you do them and the projects. So everything's very structured. And then I enter into the master program. So I'm taking courses while uh, starting to do research and also um, teach as a GSI. So there I'm starting to feel a bit of more of a, a need to manage my time well uh, or manage my time better um, to balance uh, the courses I take, the research and the uh, teaching job that I need to do as well as my personal life and uh, starting I guess this semester particularly I'm not taking any more courses now so my entire time is now focused on uh, like entire work time is focused on research now so I, now I feel, do feel more of a need to like uh, manage my time well and leave time for my um, like personal leisure as well so uh, but I do want to say um, uh, I do still have a personal life, so I play a lot of video games and I go hiking a lot and like take walks and go to the gym, etc. cetera. Um, uh, yeah, but I think uh, the, the graduate transition uh, taught me how to um, like learn to manage my time better.
saying you, you, you did, uh, any anything that you would like to add about sure. your own experiences uh, yeah um i do want to echo that like everybody everyone's talking about how like in phd program like your time is less structured compared to undergrad or even masters so like one solution that i found was to um take music lessons so in, in, in my background here, this is on the bell towers on campus. There's an instrument in there where you can play. So like by chance and circumstances, I started taking this bell playing uh, lesson. And by doing that, it gives me like a kind of rhythm. Like I, I will still have homework to do, like things to practice. And I have commitment of like turning in homeworks and so on. So it's like a nice way of introducing some structure and accountability, like more immediate than say like a paper deadline. So that's kind of my personal life now. And I think it's a great way to like add structure to your time and you know have a bit of fun while doing the PhD. And I would like to follow up on that and, and ask uh, how different is it uh, now that we, you know, we're dealing with coronavirus, right? Uh, yeah. How different is it now than than how it was before? I mean, obviously, there's there's all these additional stresses, right? Oh, is that a question for me? Or? Well, sure, of course. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, I think coronavirus specific, like I've just been staying home and doing my work, and since my advisor is not here, anyways he moved to Northwestern. <laughs> so um, like it doesn't impact me as much, um, just research wise. Um, but, I, but that's just my personal experience. And I've definitely had like COVID scares well, and my throat is hurting and that kind of stuff. But yeah, um, maybe others can add their own experience. And so I can follow up in this case. Um, in my particular case, I am still in my home country. So I am taking all of my courses right now uh, virtually. And obviously it's not something that you expect. And it was kind of like a funny thing because the day after I got my acceptance letter was the day uh, we as a country entered into lockdown. So it was a bit of a bummer. And it also like puts you in perspective, like how social learning is, because yes, uh, when you are in grad school and you're focusing in your own courses and your own research, it can be a little isolating because you will only meet your classmates or your lab partners and not many more people. But uh, now in the stands, you realize that there is a power in learning when you are sharing a space with other people, because it's, it, takes you from just learning from a course or reading a book or doing some programming exercise on your own to a community experience that you can talk about and discuss or even just like complain, you know, oh, I don't understand anything at all. I need to study more uh, because that also helps you build uh, how you can communicate about these things with other people. So that's actually an added uh, difficulty now that I don't think much people were expecting because as in technology you know that yes, that we can do a lot of things virtually and there is a lot of progress we can do when, while we are not in the same room with the things that we're working on. But often we don't think about this like social challenges that sometimes um, are added into our experiences. Would others like to add anything? Yeah, sure. Um, so for me, things are uh, things definitely feel uh, different. So I'm an international student from China. So uh, I, I guess for the past few months, I talked to my parents more because um, I can't go home and they're really far away. They can't come here any uh, either. Um, but the other thing that um, it's important to me is um, because usually when I work in the office, I have all the lab mates around me. But when I work at home, it's just me and my desk and my bed. So it feels kind of different. So one thing we did was um, uh, everyone in our lab just joined the Zoom call and uh, do our work there. Um, so that like keeps uh, the feeling of uh, being around people um, there. 
And uh, the, uh, the other thing would be to uh, occasionally hang out with uh, a few friends um, to talk about life or research or uh, academic or anything. Uh, I think that um, it's been helping me a lot. All right, so there is uh, one popular question. Uh, so this is going to be a com complete detour from what we've been talking about just now. There's a popular question uh, that a lot of people wanted to know about. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting to ask you as well, because when uh, we asked similar questions in the uh, faculty panel, uh, it got kind of brushed over as you know not really important and I know you know you're not making decisions about admissions necessarily but you are data points so I, I, I want to ask you uh, as well so it says here how important is GPA in the admission process if you're applying straight from the undergrad but I would like to expand it in general how important is GPA and I again I understand you're not necessarily making the admissions decisions here, uh, but I want to hear about your perspectives and maybe even if you're willing to share your experiences, uh, maybe you were in a similar situation stressing out over something like a GPA. Um, now, I, I don't want to call anyone in particular, but Andrew made, made, uh, made my life easier and unmuted himself. <laughs> sure, yeah, so I, um, I, I I've got some, I guess, interesting experiences with this. So uh, when I first, so I was the undergrad, went from the undergrad to the PhD. Um, and uh, for some context, my pre-college experience was very liberal arts. I didn't have lots of, I didn't really have any math and science before I got to college. Um, and so I had an okay GPA. I had a 3.7 when I exited the exited grad school, which is a good GPA. I, I was very happy with it. But I had A's in all the wrong things. I had A's in English. I had A's in my, uh, I, I had, for like my math, I typically would get a C in math. Um, and uh, my upper level engineering courses were, they were good. They were a mix of A's and B's, which I was very proud of, but they certainly didn't compare to some of the people who I was uh, around. Um, on top of that, I had a number of other problems with my application. Um, and so for me, um, I had a pretty good GPA, all things considered, but I think what's way more important than the GPA is why you got that GPA and explaining a little bit more in your essays, um, some context behind that number, okay? Some people get a 4.0, okay? That's fantastic. Some people don't have to work to get that 4.0. And if you didn't have to work through undergrad to get that 4.0, then you are unprepared for the PhD. I, that sounds blunt, but um, really one of the key things about the PhD is the perseverance and the pushing through difficult problems, difficult challenges. Um, and so if you got a 4.0 because you worked your butt off and you uh, learned to study, you learned to work through and push through challenges, that's awesome. Um, if you got a 3.2, uh, maybe that's a little bit on the low side, but if you got a, it, well, yeah, maybe. Um, if you got a low GPA, but one of the reasons is because you overcame all of these extra challenges and you still were able to get up to a 3.2, um, that's also great. Um, I don't think that that eliminates you from the process at all. I think what's way more important is the story behind the number, not just the number itself. Does anyone else have a take on this? Uh, maybe even if you wanna look at it from the perspective of masters, both Nell and Kevin, you, uh, well, uh, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I totally agree with uh, what Andrew has said. Um, so I, I think GPA is like a, you can you can see it as a reflection of your attitude towards um, anything uh, or to, towards um, like learning. Um, if you can get a pretty good GPA that shows that you're really serious uh, about uh, what you're doing and uh, it, it sort of reflects on your um, potential to do uh, serious research. Um, but being said, having said that, uh, I also uh, agree with what Andrew had said, which is uh, if you uh, overcame all the uh, all these challenges to get a, a like a 3.2, I think that's also worth uh, mentioning in your essay. Um, but uh, the other thing I, I heard, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the difference between the master's and the PhD uh, program. So. I believe for PhD uh, admissions, they're more looking more for your research potential. Um, so as long as you don't have a like a terrible GPA, um, 
then you should be fine. But if you're uh, looking forward to apply for a more uh, like non-research focused master's program, I think uh, the GPA is slightly, uh, has a slightly higher weight. Yeah, um, so I actually, initially I planned to just apply straight uh, to the PhD program from undergrad, uh, but that didn't get me in because at that time I didn't have any uh, much research experience. Um, so I uh, joined the master's program and there I got more um, research experience and that uh, I think helped me with it, uh, getting to the PhD program here. Yeah, I so I'll kind of volunteer some information. I had a pretty trash GPA for undergrad, um, and that didn't really hamper me in any way. I think um, probably don't worry too much about the numbers. Uh, you know, there's also the GRE that's gonna just put some numbers on your uh, on your application, but I don't think that these numbers will filter you out. Um, you're still going to have a chance at getting in um, and they definitely don't reflect like your potential in um, graduate studies uh, so if you if you do need to include like you know here's why um you know this isn't as high as like uh targets that may maybe publish that's fine but um definitely don't let any any low numbers discourage you from applying and also just to again point out this this year we are not even asking for the GREs right so um, hopefully we are moving towards uh, less kind of quantitative evaluation that way um, all right so I actually um, I I don't want to dismiss the issue of GPA because I know you know a lot of students are asking about it and, and it maybe maybe just the system itself is uh, adding some stress by you know putting some numbers next to the, you know, application or, or on the application web page. Uh, but, but I do want to talk about some of the other things that are, that are perhaps important. Um, so I would like to move away from GPA and ask about some of the more practical side of things of being a, a PhD. So there is a question here uh, that says, uh, what are the PhD stipends like? Um, and it looks like uh, whoever asked the question is uh, satisfied even with an approximate range. Uh, and what about the cost of living in an Arbor area, uh, rent, commuting, uh, all of those kinds of things? Um, and again, I don't have anyone in particular to, to call on. Um, so who, who would like to go on, go first about this one? This affects everyone. Um. Well, I can just talk about numbers, I guess. Oh, great. Um, I mean, I had assumed that we all receive like a the same stipend for the PhD students, right? This is a time to um, find out. <laughs> are you are you guys paid more than I do? <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess like after tax, it's a bit more than two thousand dollars per month, um, and that's that's actually a livable amount in an upper um and just since i started the phd program i've been like thinking about personal finance and everything and try to like make a budget and portion the money this much i want to spend on rent and this much i want to spend on food and transportation and all that so i had some some thoughts about that but the a bit over two thousand stipend is definitely doable in Nauber, but you're not gonna, it depends on your living standards and like uh, what kind of compromises you wanna make. Um, just in terms of rent, I think you can get somewhere to stay uh, anywhere from maybe $500 to $2,000 per month. Um, so like how you want your living environment to be do you want to share an apartment with someone do you want to live alone like those decisions will uh, affect how much money you're going to spend on rent um, and parking is not free on campus so take the bus um, what else maybe someone else can jump in yeah and maybe yeah. If, if you don't mind you know sharing uh, 
actual personal experiences, you know, telling us where do you live and how much, you know, do you pay? Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it, there's, there's no shame in sharing these kinds of things, especially <laughs> how much you're making, because one of my own students in discussions about how much they were making realized that there was a, there was a, an HR error or accounting error for, for a long time. So talk about these things, you, yeah, you, you know, yeah. prepare, make um, sure. Yeah, it's definitely doable. And I think I follow that, like, there's a rule for that, like 50, 30, 20 rule for like budgeting. Like you put your 50% 50, 50 of your money into like rent and food and all the necessities. And I can, I'm able to do that, like following those like financial advice. And I recently discovered that there's like a retirement account you can contribute to as a PhD student that I didn't know before. So I'm doing that also. Um, my grad school has taught me a lot in terms of money, but yeah, I think the stipend is livable. You're not going to live too comfortably, but uh, it's doable. Uh, is there anyone who maybe lives in uh, uh, student housing? Uh, I know that's maybe less common for graduate students. Any other uh, accommodations that you have, maybe you can share and give some examples if, if you don't mind, of course. Yeah, I can, I can jump in with some of my experiences. So I was actually just pulling up my, my bank account right now um, to look and see exactly how much I was getting each month. So after tax, I'm getting about 2400 a month, just a little bit over. Um, now, I think that number varies in terms of how much you're actually getting into your bank account because of taxes and whatnot. I don't think I get hardly anything at, you know during tax time or whatever, but that's beside the point. Um, I live in an apartment, uh, not student housing. Uh, it's about a 15 minute walk from my building, which is on North Campus. Um, I pay, I live with a roommate and we pay about 1500 a month. So I pay about 750. Um, and yeah, the, by the fact that I live so close to campus, I usually walk to, to campus, which for some context, I'm from Florida and I live in Michigan and I'm still able to handle that walk. So if, uh, if that's something that is concerning to anyone, um, as someone who's accustomed to hundred degree weather, when it gets down below, if you have the right jackets, you're going to be just fine. I promise. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, and this is this type of thing is going to vary based because I mentioned that I travel about once a month and when I travel, I, I mean flying. So I have enough to cover all my expenses. Um, I go do these these trips about uh, once a month or so. Um, I admit that dancing sometimes costs some money because I'll travel for dance. Um, but even with with all those expenses with this stipend, I don't really worry too much about uh, how much I'm going to spend if I go out to eat with someone. Um, if some group of people are going to go go watch the movies or something, <clears throat> you know, pre-COVID. Um, I don't worry too much about uh, how much it's going to cost on individual instances. If I do it a lot on a, on a given month, then I'll watch out. But uh, it's enough, I, I'd say, in this environment um, or in this area. Uh, the stipend is definitely enough to not have money be at the forefront of my mind whenever I'm you know, doing my day-to-day -day activities. Um, but I do want to sort of commend the way the, the, the two parts of this question. Whenever you're looking at whatever grad school, looking at both how much someone makes and what the cost of living is, those are both very important. Um, not to to uh, not to point any fingers, but there are there's a particular state out way out in the west, maybe even the most west of the U.S. That maybe maybe that balance is a little bit different. So please keep asking that question of whoever you're looking at uh, um, you're working with. Yeah, I uh, also say that the PhD stipend is quite a bit higher than what you would receive working as a GSI, which might be your, your um, for master students, like your main source of funding. There is some disparity in those numbers. Um, so for reference, when I was working as a GSI, I made about $20,000 a year from that position. Um, I think it's probably gone up a few thousand dollars in the um, in those since that time. Um, but I make about 10 grand more per year as a PhD student, um, which is cool. I, you know, <laughs> I'm still pretty poor though. Um, the cost of living is m much more reasonable here than in like a lot of large cities. So that's nice. Um, I've lived everywhere from a, you know, a med school fraternity, you know, $400 a month um, to uh, my current position, which is like, you know, six roommates that I pay six hundred dollars a month um so there's uh definitely ways that you can kind of like make a grad student budget work um but 
yeah, uh, I guess like keep in mind, I guess the that master's students, your experiences might be a little bit different than PhD students. Unless uh, others would, you know, want to chime in a little bit here. I, I, there is another topic that I would like to uh, like us to have enough time to talk about. Uh, we did the same thing for the faculty panel. We left some time at the end. Uh, not, not again, not because it's not an important, it's a very important uh, issue, but I just wanted to make sure that we have the time um, to, to talk about it. Uh, we, we talked a little bit in the, in the faculty panel about uh, uh, DEI, uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion uh, challenges and issues. And I want to bring this up uh, to, to this panel as well. Uh, and there's one question in particular that I think is, is, is a good uh, starting point. So it says, uh, how does UMISH make sure that people from marginalized backgrounds uh, in terms of race, gender, disability, and sexuality feel supported and welcomed? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but uh, I would be happy to, to get some volunteers. I know I start most of these, so I'll try to keep my answer short here. Um, I was actually just talking to someone about this a couple of days ago, someone who was also an undergrad talking about you know, their possibility of going into their graduate program. Um, and with Michigan in particular, well, okay, so I, I admit I don't actually know a whole lot about outside of our department. I'm, my, my focus has really been kept within the department, so I'm afraid I don't have a lot of experience outside of that. However, um, I was just talking, they, one of the things that they were describing is that they're very interested in getting involved in that kind of thing. And I know that the, uh, the student organization that is made of, it's called CSEG, which is the, the Computer Science and Engineering Graduate Student Group, if you will. Uh, has recently just started a, uh, a DEI sort of committee. There's a there's a name for it, and I've, I've forgotten. I'm kind of embarrassed to say I forgot what the name is, but it exists. Um, and this is actually kind of a really great time if that's what you're interested in getting involved in as sort of a uh, as a uh, as an aside of your research um, is because we're starting to do a lot. So um, there's uh, everyone always has a lot of things that they need to improve in terms of, of uh, departments and colleges and whatnot. Um, but we're starting to get particularly active about this right now. Um, and so if you're interested in those kind of policies or those kind of ways of shaping a department to better those sort of experiences, uh, this is actually kind of a really great time to be able to put that kind of experience down and to get started on that kind of thing. So if that's something that you're passionate about, uh, I'd, this is a great time for that. You, you bring up something interesting that, that is uh, kind of goes along the lines of another question, and that is, um, what are the things that, that you as students are actually involved in uh, currently? Um, any kind of, whether these are directly related to uh, DEI issues, uh, but, you know, other activities, outreach. Um, do any, are any of you involved in it? Yeah, in my case, I would like to comment. Uh, Rackham Graduate School has a certificate in the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I am part of that. Um, it's basically a series of talks that you address very, various different things about how we can bring diversity, equity, and inclusion, both to your current uh, career, because it's open to all graduate schools here in Michigan, and, both, and to interactions between um, uh, different different like environments like you know workplace or academia or research depending on what you are more interested into and I think that on top of this there is also like a lot of the student organizations that also deal with particular issues in different communities there are the students of color of Rackham there are society for Hispanic engineers there is the spectrum center who has some organizations also for LGBTQ students in different areas here at the University of Michigan. And the thing that I would also add is that I don't think that there is like this goal of diversity and equity that people think that once we reach that, things will be okay, because there will always be things that we can work on and things that we can get better at because we have to counter years and years of history of these things being an issue. But also I think that since we have so many 
initiatives, both from our program and for graduate school and in general from the university, that we are in the right mindset that we we need to keep learning and keep to educating ourselves, both in the identity, in our own identities and the identities that other people have. That's a that's a really fabulous answer. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I I will say our department, like probably every other computer science department, like has problems with <laughs> with these issues. Like, um, just being honest, like you know, you can look at the makeup of our faculty and our students, and you can see like there is work that needs to be done, um, and. I think a lot of people are, are growing in awareness of this. I think a lot more people are recognizing that this is a problem. This isn't just did like the shake out of like some sort of meritocracy. Like people are having these discussions at Michigan. Um, and uh, we have some really awesome allies in uh, like with the faculty who are who are really like digging into these issues with us um there are some who are not so uh not so understanding but like the the more vocal um segment is towards more positively integrating um conversations around diversity equity and inclusion and not just like you know outside of like uh schooling but like like in courses and like integrating um that into like the full experience of being a graduate student um, so uh, quite recently, um, like I was able to secure funding for a tech and society reading group um, with someone else in, you know, in, in my lab. Um, and that's great. We're going to be reading like, um, you know, it's a, a series of books that like deal with these issues. Um, and I know that like there's, uh, so, so Excel is this um, women and other and others um, <laughs> group in uh, CSE, they had a very awesome book club um, this last summer that read uh, Race and Technology. Um, so like a lot of good conversations coming from that. Um, yeah, so there's so much work that needs to be done, but I think like we're not too shy about talking about those issues here. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kevin and Nell, for, for bringing this up because I, I think uh, you know we shouldn't the, the we shouldn't confuse the the desire to to make the change with uh, you know saying that oh well everything is fine um, and and the, as long as we don't we have the opportunity to talk about these issues and and try to solve them uh, but I also really uh, like Kevin's point that uh, you know. It's never, never there, there's never such a thing as it's now solved. Let's let's move on. These are the things that we constantly have to work on. Um, so this this was this was great to to hear. Um, and I, I also you know would like to let others you know chime in if if there there's something uh, that they would like to add. All right, well, it is 2.50. Um, and I know that this would have been the time to, to stop, but there is one last question uh, that, that I wanted to ask, uh, just give everyone an opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to answer. I know that there's so many uh, great questions here that we just, just don't have the time to, to touch on all of them. Uh, uh, everything from, uh, you know, uh, the different experiences before uh, graduate school and so on. But um, uh, there's one thing that I think is very, very important in these uh, early stages of the application and just after you get the application, and that is choosing your advisor. And I just want to ask you, how, how did you actually choose your advisor? I, I, don't, I don't want us to skip on that important question. I know, Shaying, you, you, you uh, brought up, uh, you know, your, your advisor a couple of times. So you, you want to go first? How, how did okay. you make the choice and, and how are you dealing with, with the challenges that you brought up? Oh, yeah. Um, so um, I guess I chose my advisor because he admitted me. <laughs> 
okay so like when i was applying um i was like browsing through like the faculty listing at michigan and i thought oh, wow this person does interesting stuff so i want to say in my uh, statement of purpose that oh i want to work, work for this person and apparently uh, i guess during interview like there would be like interviews in january and february during the interviews and I just found that we had like shared interest in, you know, communicating science with visualization, that kind of um, mutual interest. So I just stuck with my advisor like uh, for three years now. So, um, and I guess just during last semester, my advisor moved from Michigan to Northwestern. Um, so that's a bit of a, it's not, that bit of a transition to me, I guess. I'm still like advised by my advisor. It's just um, that I needed to find an academic advisor here in Michigan. And um, I did it sort of last minute, um, um, but the department was helpful and uh, I was like brought up during the faculty meeting and eventually um, I got a new uh, academic advisor on paper um, so that I can you know, continue in my program. Um, yeah, so that, that was like my advisor story. I don't know if there's any um, follow up questions or people want to know or. <laughs> Uh, Shang, you actually uh, unmuted yourself, and I, I was going to ask uh, because I, I was actually curious how how your trajectory maybe changed uh, your advisor search. Yeah, so I think my experience is kind of unique because I uh, get to know my advisor as an undergraduate student. So I was taking this course, Introduction to Machine Learning, and I I was one of the first um, like upper level um, like. Uh, computer science courses that I took. And I um, really got in uh, to the topic of machine learning and really, uh, um, because my advisor, Professor Jenna Wins, she was really passionate and enthusiastic when she teaches. And uh, so I decided to um, like uh, to teach as a, uh, like a TA for her and then started doing research. And then I just kept um, working with her ever since my undergrad and to the master's and the PhD program. So there wasn't any like official interview process afterwards, um, unlike uh, many other people would do when they uh, apply to a new school and search for an advisor. Um, but I do think it's the, like we, like through the years of uh, working together, we know each other uh, better. And uh, yeah, there wasn't necessary for another interview because we know what each other uh, is doing and what we're, uh, uh, enthusiastic, enthusiastic about the same things. Now, I'm, I'm very curious about your story. All right, Nicola is my advisor, so I have to give you guys the <laughs> the kind version of what happened. Um, now, I was doing um, research in a different lab um, in the in the department, and it wasn't a great fit for me. Um, to be honest, uh, the lab culture was not a great fit for my desires and, and my lifestyle, but um, I took a class with Nicola and um, he really encouraged me while I was um, completing the final project for his course. And uh, kind of from there, like recognizing that he was like encouraging me to pursue my own interests. Um, and uh, we had a, a nice coincidence of, um, coincidence of, um, you know, political beliefs and uh, other other um, interests. Uh, it, I felt very comfortable working with him. And uh, when it came time to uh, turn in the application, he was my top pick for advisor. And yeah, it worked out. Now, Kevin, I don't know if, if you're involved in research or not, but I'm also curious from maybe perspectives of either your own or, or other master's students, uh, how does that work? Uh, finding somebody to to work with uh, when there isn't really a research advisor. Well, yeah, and in my experience here and uh, at some point in the master's are assigned to uh, like a common advisor or the group advisors and you go to them 
and they are technically the people that you go to for questions or if you are interested in pins. But also, like my experience was a bit more particular because, as I mentioned, I am a Fulbright scholar, so I had to contact some professors here also at Michigan. And one of my experiences that I really, really enjoyed was that you writing emails to people that you are interested with, even if they don't answer, because I did have some answers and I have people that didn't answer to me, that also helps you like um, realize more or less what you want to work on. And like currently this semester, I am not doing uh, active research, but I am already planning like who I want to talk with when the next semester begins, or you know, when we are in the middle of uh, the break between semesters and what ideas we might have for, you know, for doing some research or for collaborating in a project, you know. And I think that in either way, a lot of um, what would make your relationship with anyone you're working with, but I think especially with your advisor is that you also show some initiative and say, this is the thing that interests me and this is the thing that I want to work with. And, you know, and may, that's the way where you find if the other people have the same interests, that they can guide you, or maybe they can, hey, I don't particularly work on this, but this person does, you know, and that, uh, that's also like a helpful thing to take into account sometimes. And uh, Andrew, you want to be the, the last uh, answer for this panel? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, so just so that it said, um, the choice of your advisor uh, is probably the single most important part of the whole graduate student application and acceptance experience. Um, I actually read a paper a couple years ago that said uh, your relationship with your advisor is the most important determining factor for your success in graduate school. Um, I think the way that they phrased it in the paper in their study was, does the advisor actually have your back? Um, and I think they put it in different words, but I, I, I sort of generalized there. Um, and now that I'm actually going into my fourth year, I absolutely agree with that. Um, now, not to, it's really hard to really know these advisors before you pick them, right? And so, you know, it's, that sounds terrifying from your perspective, and I absolutely get that. Um, one thing that you should know is that it's really not a big deal if you change advisors. Um, there's not a big stigma to it. Um, I've had a number of friends who have either had a different advisor or has the same advisor that I have. The relationship just didn't work. Uh, they found a different advisor and that was totally fine. It didn't involve a big fight, but there wasn't any hard feelings. That's a natural part of this process. Um, and I think it's really important to be in a program that allows for that sort of transition to happen. Um, whenever I talk to people about picking an advisor, I always just say that there's three things that you want to have that connects with them. Um, the first one being, how comfortable are you with your advisor? Um, are you able to engage with your advisor in an uncomfortable topic? Um, did, is the data not at all showing you what you thought it would show you? Um, do you need to take a break for some, per like a week break for some personal reason? Are you able to have these difficult conversations? Um, the second one being, what are the other graduate students doing? Um, are they doing things that you want to be doing? Do you see the recent graduates of this advisor doing the type of things that you want to do. Are they all going into academia? Do you want to go into industry? Maybe that's not quite the right fit. Um, but seeing if there's a connection between what the current students and the graduated students are doing versus what you want to do, and you want to make sure those are aligned. Uh, and then the last one is basically, do you, does the advisor have experiences that you want to learn from? So one of the things that was important to me was having an advisor that wasn't exclusively an advisor and a professor, but also had other um, roles in the department and at the university. Um, and so that was one of the things that I wanted to learn from is how they balance all these different things. Um, and so that was important to me. And I think that whatever the equivalent is for you, you'll want to look at for that as well. Um, but if you don't listen to anything I say other than this, uh, please devote a lot of effort and thought into what you want in an advisor uh, and making sure that you can find that. But take comfort knowing that if you don't find it right away, there's nothing wrong with going to someone else later on. Thank you so much. This was so really great answers. And I think it, it highlights at least one thing, and that is talk to other students, talk to them about their experiences with their advisors and see if that's what you what you're hoping to have as well. This is great. Uh, you know, let, let's thank our panel. It's it's the three o'clock already. Um, I will still uh, split you in uh, breakout rooms. And if our panelists have